Hey, thanks for joining us here today at Victory Church, where we invite people to belong before they believe. If you want to know more about who we are and what we do, or if any of our messages have impacted your life and you would like to partner with us in giving to this ministry, we invite you to do so by visiting our website at victory.church. Now, let's check out this week's message. All right, I get to introduce our speaker today. He spoke at the men's conference. We had an amazing, absolutely incredible men's conference, guys. I'm just going to let you know. Uh, your, your husband should have come home different. If they didn't have them, you call Pastor Oscar and tell uh, Pastor Oscar or Pastor Wade. Uh, most people try to guess who our guest speaker is based on how tall the podium is that week. Because it's an adjustable podium, and if I'm preaching, it's way up here. And if Cameron's preaching, it's down by my knees. It's down there somewhere. But today, I'm, I'm excited to introduce um, Pastor Marcus Burkeen to our house. Uh, Pastor Marcus is a man that I serve with uh, at Gateway Church um, as my role at the King's University. We serve on the same executive team at Gateway Church, and we're on a, a, a kind of a, it's called a, a apostolic team, a leadership team at, at Gateway, and he and I have become very close, and there's a lot of gems, what I would call gems or diamonds within Gateway. Okay, Gateway's an amazing church. Um, they have about 700 employees, and Riddled within all of these 700 employees are a lot of really talented, really anointed, really, really amazing uh, men and women of God. And in my opinion, Marcus is one of the best ones there. And I have plucked him out and drug him to Oklahoma uh, to, to pour into our family today. He's an amazing man. He, 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 uh, he has five children uh, that are, most of them are grown. So I've been learning a lot from him in the, the role of parenting, but I'm so excited that he's here and I know you're going to be blessed by it. Edmund OKC. Would you do me the favor of honoring him by standing to your feet and let's welcome to the stage, pastor Marcus Burkeen. Thank you, brother. Hey, I appreciate it. Uh huh. Hey, thank y'all. Y'all are very, very, very kind. Please have a seat. Howdy Edmund. Glad you guys are with us today, and uh, we are going to take a look at some important things in uh, the Word of God today, and I am going to feed into your discussion of identity today. And so if you brought your Bibles, uh, you can open them to 2 Samuel chapter 9, and uh, you, you've talked a little bit about the orphan spirit and so I want to I wanna walk you through a story in the Bible about an orphan today. And I'm really glad. I, I am uh, developing a great friendship with Pastor John. And I'm glad that, that you're, you're in a good church. I, you know, I tell people a lot, if, if you're in a bad church, you ought to just leave and go find yourself a good church. I don't like church hoppers. It's not healthy to hop church to church, but, but sink some roots in and, and build some relationships. And, and there's some, some great fruitfulness that God talks about that comes into your life just as an added blessing when, when you spend your life in a good church. And so if you're, if you're not part of a church, well, you've stumbled into a good one today. And this would be a great place for you to sink some roots down. But, but I'm telling you that, that it, it's a real blessing that you're in a house that will address real issues. And the orphan spirit is a real thing that, that so many Christians deal with. And, and it, it, part of it is we, we just sort of feel a certain way about everything. And we have no idea that, that it's, it's, an, it's a spiritual orphanness inside of us. And it can, it can hinder you all the days of your life. And, and the truth is, is that a lot of times Christians expect God to do everything. And, and there, there are things that only God can do. You can't save yourself. Only God can save you. 
But there are things that God says are true about you. And if you don't believe those things or if you act as though they're not true, your life in God is, is not going to be very pleasurable for you. And pleasure is not the goal, okay? But, but it is really important that we see ourselves the way God sees us. Uh, my, my wife's uh, grandmother passed this summer, and uh, she was, she was a, a tremendous human being. Uh, I loved, she was always sharp mentally, she was a little punchy, and uh, she'd tell you the truth. I love people that'll, that'll tell you the truth. She moved to Rising Star, Texas in a covered wagon. So she had a good ride. But this summer, before she passed, my wife and I were able to, to drive to Houston and see her. And uh, there was a nurse that came in right when my wife, she just, I don't know where she got this question, but this, this question bubbled up and out of my wife's heart. And she, she said, Mimi, why is it that when some people get old, they get bitter? And others get sweeter. And I thought, where did that come from? And I thought, I might ought to get my pen and take some notes here. And, and here's what Mimi said. Hope. It comes down to hope. People that, people that get bitter when they get old, they have no hope. And I thought to myself... It's important for us who are younger, we who are younger, that, that we, we have a, a habit of walking with, with a pure heart. I don't want to let any bitterness start taking root. Amen? Because if, if it does, what happens? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get old and, and get nasty. I, I don't want to be a, a nasty old man. I want to be a happy, I want to be the, the happiest guy in the house when I'm old. But it really, it, it comes down to hope. Have you, have you anchored yourself to something beyond what you see today? That's really what it comes down to. And, and I was reading about, after Mimi said this, in Galatians 4, 7, I, I thought, I, what does the Bible say about this? Galatians 4, 7 says, you're no longer slaves, but children of God. And I thought, this really is, is the anchor of hope. Because there are so many days that I don't feel like a child of God. But do you know it's still true of you, even on the days that you don't feel like it? It's still true. And I realized that there are there are, it's important to God that you and I know what to contend for and what to rest in. And some days we rest in things that God wants us to contend for, and sometimes we contend for things that God wants us to rest in. As Pastor John said, my wife and I have five kids, and three of them no longer live, they're in college, and they're out. Our first daughter got married this summer. But you know what? When they come over, they pull up in front of the house, and they've got a key. And they say, that's my house. And they say, that's my room. And they walk into the kitchen and say, that's my fridge. And they go into the pantry and say, that's my food right there in the pantry. And you know what? They've never made a mortgage payment. They've never helped old dad with the bills. But you know what? They're my kids. And that's exactly how I want them to feel at my house. I, they don't have to contend to be my children because they're my children. And this is exactly I think sometimes we contend to be children of God, and God's like, you don't have to fight for that. 
And so we're going to open the scripture today. And, and, and this, this little story, it's just tucked away. It's not very long. It's not very popular. But if, but if you will allow the word of God to speak truth over you today, it will allow you to rest in things God wants you to rest in so that you can contend for things that God wants you to contend for. So this is 2 Samuel chapter 9, and we're going to be introduced to, to a, a guy named Mephibosheth in just a moment. And, and, and he was an orphan. He was an orphan. It's important that you know that. This is verse 1. David asked, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They called him to appear before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba, your servant? He replied. The king asked, Is there no one still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? And Ziba answered the king, there's still a son of Jonathan. He's crippled in both feet. Well, where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, he's at the house of Machir, son of Amiel, in Lodavar. Lodavar. So let me, let me tell you a little bit, just so you know the history of what's happening here. So, so Saul was the king of, of Israel, had a son named Jonathan, and Jonathan and David were best friends. Okay? And so when, when Saul was anointed king, but he didn't act like the king very well, and so David was anointed, and Jonathan knew, my, my dad's trying to kill my best friend. And so he said to him one day, he said, he said hey, look, when you become the king, and I think everybody, including my, my dad, knows that you're going to be the king, he said, will you remember my family? Here's why this is important. Because when, when the Philistines killed Saul and Jonathan, this, this, the, the nurse that was taking care of little Mephibosheth, you can read about this five chapters earlier, 2 Samuel 4. But little Mephibosheth was five years old. And when Saul and Jonathan were killed in battle, the nurse picked him up and began to run with him to get him out of harm's way. Well, as she ran with him, she tripped and fell. And little Mephibosheth was caught underneath her, and it ruined his feet. He was crippled for life. And so, and so part, of, part of the other part, of the, you need to know this part of the story as well, is that, is that when a new king comes in, it's a common practice that he hunts and finds and kills all the family members of the former king so that nobody can ever raise up a, from the old monarchy, gather a, a force, and come and retake the kingdom. So Mephibosheth had a lot of reason to be concerned. The king found me. And so he gets called in. So David had him brought in, verse 5, from Lo Devar, from the house of Machir, son of Amiel. And when Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth. And I wonder sometimes if maybe, you know, your dad was my best friend. I bounced you on my knee when you were three years old. Where have you been? And he's thinking, I've been hiding from you. You know, I've been, I've been hoping you'd never find me. And so when, when Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. And David said, Mephibosheth, your servant, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul. And you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? 
And the king summoned Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I've given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table, and he was crippled in both feet. So let me, if, if you and I could today have a conversation with Mephibosheth, let me give you three things that I think he would say to us. Number one is this, your identity is greater than your brokenness. Who the king says you are is a lot different than who you say you are. Your identity is a lot greater than your brokenness. In many ways, all of us are crippled. And this was his self-identification. And I've, I've struggled, I, I have to admit, I've struggled a little bit with how to talk about this today because there, there are some people that, that are crippled physically, and I don't know what that's like. I really don't. But I do know that at David's table, there were at least two who were crippled. One of them was Mephibosheth, but the other was David. You know, two chapters later, he committed adultery with Bathsheba and then killed her husband in the whole cover-up scheme. How, do you, how many of you know that's crippled man right there? One people could see, the other was hidden in the heart, but no less crippled. And every time anybody looked at Mephibosheth at David's table, here's what they thought. Number one, he's crippled. And number two, his grandfather used to be the king. Now, how many of you know that if your grandfather's the king, life has some upshot? Uh, there's some things that are available to you that are not available to the general public. And so you grow up in the palace thinking this will all be mine someday. And then all of a sudden it's all gone. And you live in hiding in poverty. And I wonder, I wonder what it's like every day eating scraps and thinking how different life turned out for me than I had planned. I don't know if you, like me, when, when I was teenager, early 20s, mid 20s, and I used to think about what is, what is Marcus going to be like when he's, when he's older? And I thought about life in my 40s, Life in my 50s, life in my 60s, life in my 70s, life in my 80s. And I just started imagining what kind of an old man that I would be. Started thinking about what kind of job I'd have, how I was going to handle my money, savings, when I wanted to retire, the kind of work that I wanted to do. And can I just tell you, there have been some unexpected turns in my life. And life hasn't turned out the way I imagined that it would. Now, we are way too quick to blame our circumstances on other people. Most of us do. It's one of my fault. But you know what the truth is, is that, is that there are people here today, and your crippleness really is the fault of somebody else, like Mephibosheth. That wasn't his fault. His nurse picked him up to save his life. Her, her intentions were, were golden. But then there are accidents. And she trips and falls. She got up fine. He never walked again. And sometimes it really is somebody else's fault. And we look around at life and, and think, you know what, it just hasn't, 
turned out the way I thought. And every time he looked at his feet, it was a reminder of his lost fortune. But David came that day to release truth over Mephibosheth. And so he said, well, who am I that you would notice a dead dog like me? Listen, David had used those same words after he killed Goliath, 1 Samuel 18, 18. When, when he showed up at the fight, he said, he said I, I don't really appreciate this brute. What will be done for the guy that kills him? And they said, man, no more taxes. You get to marry the king's daughter and life... The upshot just gets a lot better for you from there. And he goes, I'll do that. I'll do that. And so when he comes in and, and Saul is going to give Michael, his, his daughter, to David as his wife, he says, who am I that I would marry the king's daughter? And so when Mephibosheth said almost exactly the same thing, David remembered I've said those words before. Do you know who am I is a good question? It's just the second question. Who is God is a better question. That's really the question on the table. And can I just give you some breaking news today? We are far more obsessed with ourselves than we are with God. We, we talk about ourselves a lot more than we talk about God. And when we, you know, the, the, the prophet says, if you're going to brag, brag about God. And what we do is most of the time is we spend our lives talking about ourselves and our crippledness. A divorce, a bankruptcy, a failed business. And we tell people, this is who I am. And I wonder if God's going, does it matter what I think about you? And so, a lot of times, we, I think, I wonder how many of us in our prayer time with God, we say, God, look at me. I'm not much. I'm a lot like a dead dog. And here's what God would say to you today. You know what? Let's start with friendship. See where it goes. You just be friends with God? Because at some point in your friendship with God, you're going to start talking a lot more about God than you talk about yourself. Best thing about me is God. The best thing about my life is God. And so... Let's just start with friendship and see where it goes. And the accuser is going to come to you and say, hey, who do you think you are? And God intends that you are so distracted by your inheritance, the hope that you have in heaven, that you just stop paying attention altogether to the accuser. Here's what David said to Mephibosheth. He said, he said, who am I that you'd notice a dead dog like me? And here's what the king said. When I look at you, I don't see a dead dog. I see royalty. I see an heir to a vast fortune. Mephibosheth said, dead dog, royalty. Dead dog, I think I like yours better. Can I, can I just say to you, don't argue with the king. Don't argue with the king. His, his is better. And, and, and the inheritance that you already possess, according to 1 Peter, can never perish, spoil, or fade. It's kept in heaven for you. Do you know it already is your possession? It already belongs to you and is kept in heaven for you. And God intends that the revelation of that would distract you from everything else on earth. Who are you? The heir to a vast fortune. That's who you are. Some struggles? You bet. But those don't define me. Those don't define you. 
You're the heir to a vast fortune. So your identity is greater than your brokenness. Here's the second thing that you need to know is that God is not disabled by your brokenness. Whatever it is that you think cripples you, it doesn't tri- cripple God. It does not hinder anything about what God has planned for you. And if we're honest today, most of us would say that we're crippled in many ways. I've been through this and I've been through that and I've been frauded. Had a guy that invited me into a business deal and I I ended up getting frauded. Sued by a bank for $350,000. And I don't have money. You know, but what I, what all that I had, I spent to defend myself. And I, at, at, a, at the age when most of my friends were starting to plan for their retirement, I zeroed out every account that I had. So I know a little bit about being crippled, just a little bit. Not, not near what some of you are. But we all have a choice from then on to identify ourselves. I'm the guy that will never retire. That's who I am. God goes, no, no, (laughs) not how I see it. But we tell people, here's who I am. And God goes, "Can can I weigh in on that? Let me give you four ways that all of us are crippled. All of us are crippled in at least four ways. Number one is weakness. Just stuff you're not good at. Just, you know, the way you handle money, the way you handle your marriage, the way that you handle your relationships. You could improve. You could take a class. You could get better. But all of us have places where I'm just weak. Just not good at that. All right. The, the second way is iniquity. And, and this is what Exodus chapter 20 verse 5 says, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. And so uh, God visits the iniquities of the fathers on the children to three and four generations. All right, so if, if you read the NIV like I do, the, the NIV wrongly, wrongly uh, translates this. The NIV says that God visits the sins of the fathers on the children. doesn't say that. Visits the iniquity. The iniquity is the cause. The sin is the effect. So it's a cause and effect. Now, what God visits upon children or iniquities, the causes. And so, so a little boy grows up in a house where his dad handles stress with alcohol. Okay? So when he gets stressed out, when he's 30, don't be surprised if he starts drinking. Because this is, this is his model. This is what he knows. All right? So, so the iniquity is addiction. The sin could be alcohol or drugs or opioids or work or sex or porn or anything else. But what we do is we find a way to numb pain. And dad taught me how to do that, right? So that's that's why the iniquities are, it's not the sins that are visited, it's the iniquities. The third way that all of us are crippled in some way is, is physically. We just all just, there's just stuff wrong. I I inherited high cholesterol. I've had doctors tell me for years, we have got to get you on a statin drug. All right, we got to to lower that cholesterol. You can't see it, but but every time I go to the doctor for a blood test, you know, and I got to deal with fear. You know, early death from a heart attack or whatever it is. 
But it's just, it's just a physical thing. And, and all of us have things about ourselves that we are frustrated with. It's usually, it's usually the first thing you look at when you look in a mirror. You look at that thing and go, I hate that. And all of us have them. But you know the fourth way that we're all crippled is inherent. Just inherent. Here's what that means. God created you with limitations. To create need for himself. I, I wanted to be a professional athlete. And God made me small. And I know that, you know, I've had friends, well, Spud Webb could dunk. He was only 5'6". Yeah, there hadn't been but one of him. Okay? <laughs> but I, I wanted to play, to play professional sports. But here's the thing. If God had gifted me physically... I probably would have ignored his call on my life. And so God limited me on purpose to, to encourage me. I tell people, I'm, I'm, I'm small, but I'm slow. I just, I'm, I'm, I am not ever going to get to professional sports from here. And, and I really, it's part of God's encouragement for me to answer the call. But here, here's one of the reasons he does that, is, is to create room in our lives for him, a need. And the truth is, is that if God gave you a magic wand and said, I'm going to let you fix five things about your life, anything you want to fix, do you know you'd fix the very areas that God created in your life where you need him the most? You would fix your need for God, and you wouldn't need him anymore. And so I hope it doesn't offend you to know that God built in your life inherent weakness. You just got stuff that you're not ever going to get better at, not going to improve at. In the very place God called you, he will disable something important that you think you need so that you see your need for God. And so when, when God looks at us, he sees brokenness as an opportunity to show kindness, show how much he loves us. And whatever incompleteness Mephibosheth presented, it created room for God to demonstrate his love to him. And so God is not disabled just because you are. In whatever area where you are weak and broken, God himself is not disabled. And the way we deal with our crippleness is as much a contributor to our success as the way we deal with our strengths. It really is. So here's the third thing that you need to know is that God is not ashamed of your brokenness. God doesn't just tolerate you. When, you. when you come for prayer, he's not going, oh, great, here she is again. You know, gosh, she always prays the same old stuff. You know, this is, this is, not, this is not God's opinion of you. So before David lived in Jerusalem, he was the king of, of Israel. He lived in Hebron. And, and Jerusalem, before it was, was Israel's, it belonged to the Jebusites. And so David thought to himself, I need to go capture Jerusalem. And so the king and his, this is 2 Samuel 5, beginning in verse 6, the king and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites who lived there. And the Jebusites said to David, you will not get in here, even the blind and lame can ward you off. They thought David cannot get in here. Well, here's the reason they said that. Because the, where, where Jerusalem is brilliantly set is in a, a bowl of mountains. And Jerusalem is a, is a high point in the middle. And so they built walls around the city. And you could not sneak up on anybody who lived in Jerusalem. Couldn't sneak up on them. And so David says, 
you know what, let's go conquer Jerusalem. I think I want that to be the, the capital. Let's, let's, let's put it there. And so David comes up, and they hollered from the wall, even the blind and lame could ward you off. And so, nevertheless, verse 7, David captured the fortress of Zion, the city of David. And on that day, David said, anyone who conquers the Jebusites will have to use the water shaft to reach, now listen to this dig, those lame and blind who live there. So really, who, who turned out to be blind and lame? And so really, this became... This became a saying, a tradition in Israel, the, lie, the lame and the blind cannot enter the kingdom. The lame and the blind cannot enter the palace. They were always kept at a distance. And it was a national proverb, the blind and lame will not enter the palace. And so in Leviticus 21, verse 18 says this, No man who has any defect will come near. No man who is blind or lame, disfigured or deformed. No man with a crippled foot or hand. So I want you to imagine David's surprise when he sent for Mephibosheth and they knocked at the door and they carried him in. And David starts thinking, Mephibosheth, what happened? Remember when I used to bounce you on my knee when you were three, four years old? I love you. Mephibosheth thinks, I'm dead. And David is, is going back through the law, which says he can't come in by law. He can't come in to the kingdom by law. But here's, here's 1 Samuel 20. This is David having a conversation with Jonathan, Mephibosheth's father. Show me unfailing kindness like that of the Lord as long as I live, Jonathan says, so that I may not be killed and do not ever cut off your kindness from my family. Not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. And so David made a covenant with Jonathan and it was a covenant of kindness. And so that's why he was sitting in the palace one day and he, he thought... Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul that I could just be kind to? And so he says to Mephibosheth, don't be afraid for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. Covenant says he's my family. Law says he can't come in. And so covenant trumps law. You need to hear that. Covenant trumps law. David was not ashamed to give Mephibosheth the inheritance, even though being crippled in his feet forfeited his right to it. Now, here's why this is important for you and me. Because God, when he wanted to make a covenant with humanity, he thought to himself, you know, I can keep a covenant, but they can't. So he turned to his only begotten son, Jesus, and he says, let's make a covenant. And Jesus says, I can keep that. And he says, I know you can. And you and I get in on that covenant by faith. And covenant trumps law. Your inheritance in God is determined by your covenant with God, not by your ability to give. What did Mephibosheth have to give David? He couldn't work. He had no money. He couldn't give anything. And listen, your covenant with God does not require you to give God anything either. And I want you to listen to 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters. And listen, he's, he is scattering buckshot all over the room here. Watch this. Nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes. And you're going, well, I ain't done that. Okay, hold on. 
because he's going to get to everybody in the house. Nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you It's what you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Listen, when God gave everything to Mephibosheth, it was not an exercise in property management. He loved him. It was a covenant of kindness. Mephibosheth name means to cast away shame. And his name prophesied his inheritance. You need to hear that God is not ashamed to place his name at stake in your inheritance. He's not fearful of it. And we get in on it by faith. Now I want you to think about Every time, three times a day when they ate. And they would bring Mephibosheth in there and they would set him in a chair. And they would pull, he would pull himself up. And his crippleness was hidden beneath the table. And when they sat to eat, he looked the same as everybody else. Because he was. I want you to bow your heads, close your eyes. Some of you need to hear that God's opinion of you has not changed because of you, even because of your willful choices. You have violated the law of God. You have. And God has invited you in by covenant, by faith, to an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. And God invites you today to the table, and as you pull up to the table, you look the same as everybody else. All of us are crippled. And what he says is, why don't we just start out with friendship and just see where it goes? And I want to ask right now if there's, if there's anybody here and you have never given your life to Jesus. The invitation of God to you today is, why don't we just start out with friendship and just see where it goes. And if, and, and if you decide today, I think I want to take God at his word. Nobody looking around, would you just raise your hand so that I can see it? This is, what, this is the way that you confess, God, I want to be one of your kids. Anybody want to give your life to the Lord today? So let me see your hand. Let me also say that some of you have given up on anything sweet happening in your life. There's just too much crippledness, too much loss. Too much brokenness. There's too many things that have happened for me. And here's what, here's what David said to, Saul, to, to Mephibosheth. I want to show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. And I'll restore to you everything that you lost. The people here today who have had things stolen from them. You suffered through loss. And God comes today to say, I want to restore all of that. And there are miracles held in store for you today. And I want you to receive that today. That God's eyes are on you. He sees you. He knows where you are. He knows where you live. He knows your name. He's not ashamed of you. He extends a hand today to say, let's just start with friendship and see where it goes. I want to call the prayer team to come right now. If you're part of the prayer team, would you come? 
And if there's anything that you need to say to God, I just want to invite you to come to the altar. I want to invite you to come for prayer. You don't have to be a member of Victory Church to come and receive prayer today. But all of us need prayer for something. There may be, you may have gotten some bad news from a doctor recently. You may be struggling in your health. You may be fearful over a job situation or a financial situation. And you just say, you know what, I just need somebody to pray with me. The culture of this house is we all need prayer. And if today is your day, the altar is open for you. But I'd like for all of us to stand together. And if you just open your heart, God, we we come today to worship. And we honor you with our lives. And God, we thank you today that you receive our worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us here today for this week's message. And here at Victory Church, we are called to equip people to live in His presence, move beyond ourselves, and be transformed. And this can only happen through your radical generosity, your serving, and your prayers. If this message or any of our messages have impacted your life and you would like to partner with us by giving into this ministry, you can do so by visiting our website at victory.church. Thank you again for joining us and have a great day.